Good morning. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Job, chapter 14. Job chapter 14, beginning with verse 7, we'll be reading 7 through 9. It's an honor to be here this morning. I've heard a lot about the church, and when Preston had asked me to come and speak, I could tell that he, he really thinks a lot of all of you here, and he just went on about the people that were here. I, I got the privilege last night to get on the website and read a little bit about the history and, and, and just the rich history of this church, and uh, I'm excited to be here. Are you excited to be here this morning? Job chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. If you're there, say Amen. I was trying to get you to say it a little more country. Amen. (laughs) Job 14, verse 7. For there is hope for a tree, if it is cut down, that it will sprout again. Then its tender shoots will not cease. Though its roots may grow old in the earth and its stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. The title of the message this morning is There is Hope Yet. There is Hope Yet. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you, God, that we could gather together in, in the name of Jesus this morning, Lord, and we're thankful for the promise of your word that when we come together in Your name, that You are here with us and we acknowledge You, we lift You up. God, we recognize that, that we can't even hear Your Word unless You enable us. God, give us ears to hear this morning what it is that You have to say to us. God, let us be willing to look in the mirror of Your Word and be willing not just to be hearers of Your Word, to be, to be doers of Your Word also, God. To be willing to just be changed and washed by the water of Your Word, Lord, that it would just shine a light unto us this morning. God, I just pray that you would take over. I, I, I know that I can't preach this morning without you. I know that I am incapable, God, that you didn't call me because of my strength, but you called me because of your strength, Lord. And I know that your strength is made perfect in weakness. And we just look to the cross this morning. We look to the cross and we look to Jesus. We lift you up, God, and we just glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. As I was reading this verse, and as you read it, you see it's about a tree. It's about a tree that once had life, and now as you see the picture that is presented here in these verses, the life is gone. It says that it had been cut down, and that life was seemingly lost. In fact, it goes all the way into the roots, all the way into the roots, and it says that even the stump would die in the ground. So this tree where there was once life, now it seemed like there was no hope for the tree. And I want to ask you a question this morning is, have you ever been in a place in your life where it seemed like hope was gone? Have you ever lost hope? See, it's one thing we come together and it's exciting to be together. There's strength when we come together. The Bible says where one would chase a thousand, two could put ten thousand to flight. There is strength in when we come together, but what about when we go back into the world through the week? Have you ever been in in a place where it seemed like hope was gone? Hopelessness begins with heartbreak. You don't just go straight into hopelessness. You don't go straight into depression. You don't go straight into a place where you say there's no hope. No, it begins with something. It begins with something that, that may have broken your heart. And I believe that there's different kinds of heartbreak. Yesterday, I went through some heartbreak. My son had started playing football in the Smurf League this year, and and I got the opportunity to coach. My wife, she said, don't do it, Brandon, don't coach. She knows how competitive that I can be at times, and I grew up like that, that that competitiveness in sports. And my son, I asked him, I said, do you want to play? He said, sure. And and the guy that was coaching the team happened to be a friend of mine. And he said, will you help me coach? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'm afraid. You know, I'm afraid I, I might get a little too into it. He's like, no, just come on. I said, all right. 
I'll coach, but you know, I'm just going to do it casually, just laid back. Have you ever met somebody that's laid back? You know, nothing bothers them, nothing gets to them, they just kind of stroll along through life. That's not me. And so I, I, I agreed to coaching it, coaching the football, but I was like, I'm going to do it laid back. So through the first few weeks of the season, through practice, you know, I didn't really have any expectation. and I tried not to put my heart into it too much. And as the season went along, one of the things that happened is the team started to get a little bit better. We started out pretty bad. And my son, I started to see him improving. And I started to see him really liking it. And he talked about it all the time. And, and, and a, couple, a couple of games ago, I started seeing something click in him. And he, he started getting it. He started understanding what it was he was supposed to do. And he hadn't made a tackle the whole year. And not yesterday, but the game before yesterday, against a team that had beaten us earlier in the year, he, he gets up there on the line and he busts through the line and he makes his first tackle. He was so happy he almost didn't get into the next play because he was, he was trying to tell me, Daddy, I made a tackle, I made a tackle. And I was excited too, so I, I was struggling to get into the next play. Well, well, the next play he made another tackle. And then another one. And they couldn't block him. And he's just making all kinds of tackles. And man, now, now, now something had changed. My expectation went up. My heart... You know, I'm all in now. I'm all in, and, and he's all in. And we won the game. It was only the second game we had won the whole year. Well, next up was a team that earlier in the year, it was the first game we played, they had dominated us. But man, I just knew. I was talking to my friend that was coaching. I said, it's payback. It's payback time for this next team. The team's name was Honeaker. Anybody know where Honeaker is? All right, well, we're in Richlands, okay? And we're, our name of our team is the Cowboys, and we were headed to Honeacre yesterday morning. And I mean, Brian, my son, he's so excited. And we're going, and I'm talk, we're talking to the team, and they just know we're going to win. Payback is coming, you know. We're going to get them back for beating us earlier in the year. And, and I mean, there's just so much expectation. Our heart's all the way in it. As the game goes on, it's a closely contested game. I mean, they were competitive. It's probably the best they played the whole year. And one touchdown we scored, we didn't get the extra point, And they beat us by one point. And let me tell you, I mean, the whole way home, I'm driving home. And I mean, my heart's aching. It's just broken, you know, into a thousand pieces. My son was crying right after the game. I'm, I'm crying. I mean, it's just pitiful, you know. And here I was supposed to be laid back, and now I'm... And that's the thing. You see, you won't get your heart broken if you don't put your heart out there. But if you put your heart in it, if you put your heart in it, you risk getting it broke. I think about uh, uh, teenagers and, and young people in school. I, was, I got to work in the youth ministry for several years, and, and, and it used to get on my nerves so bad because they date, you know, and they think that, you know, it's just so serious to them. But the truth is, to them it is. To them it is, they got a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and that's everything to them right then. And, and in high school, it's inevitable that somebody's going to get their heart broken from time to time. Somebody's going to get their heart broken. I think of, I think of marriages, and, and we start getting into something a little more serious, and maybe you've been through something like this or known somebody to go through it, but we, my wife and I had spoke with a lady this week who was going through some some issues in her marriage and it looked like the marriage was is going to be broken and you could just see the heartbreak. The heartbreak. It was so sad to see it just weeping and crying. I know that many of you here, you've been through that with somebody. Maybe you've been through it yourself. and It's one of the hardest things to go through. I think of another thing that's, that's hard is when we lose somebody close to us and how heartbreaking it is. I... Uh, when I was in the military, and I was a young man, and my wife and I, we'd been married a couple of years, and we were trying to have a baby, and I was so excited. It was the, you know, the first time that she'd ever gotten pregnant, and I, you know, I was, just wanted to have a family so bad, and I looked forward to it for so long. And I remember when she found out that she was expecting, she came down to the fire department. That's what I did in the military, was in the fire department. And she came down, and, and we just announced it to everybody. And, 
remember our church came to the fire. We made such a big deal. I was doing cartwheels across the parking lot. I mean, I, I called everybody I knew. I let everybody know. I mean, I, I was so excited. And within a few weeks, she ended up, something happened and she had a miscarriage. And I can remember that night in the emergency room and in the heartbreak. I'd never felt anything like it, ever. Up to that point in my life, it was the greatest heartbreak I'd ever known. And what happened is after that, you know, my wife, she wanted to jump right back in. She wanted to jump right back in and, and let's, let's go ahead and, and try again. And I didn't. And the reason is I didn't want to put my heart out there. You know, I think about Brian and the football team. It would be so easy for him now that he's, he's got his heart broke to not try as hard the next time. You know what, Dad? I'm not going to put my heart out there because I don't want to get it broke again. I think about the teenage couples that date and they break up and their heart's broke. They don't ever want to date anybody again and it can affect the relationship for years. Any relationship they have in the future because they've experienced heartbreak. The married couple, that, that their marriage is broken. It's hard for them to ever love like that again because their heart has been broken. And I, I was going through that with, with trying to have a baby as I... I didn't want to put my heart out there again because of the heartbreak. Matthew twenty-two thirty-six through 40 there was a man that came to Jesus and he asked Jesus, it says that he was a lawyer and he, he came to Jesus and he wanted to know what the greatest commandment of all was. And see, I, I look at this guy, and, and a lot of you know this passage, but I look at this guy as somebody, he was like testing Jesus. He thought he knew the answer. And I think the answer that Jesus gave him surprised him. I think he was expecting something else. But we see the heart of the Gospel in what Jesus says. He says, without hesitation, He says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the, the, the next one is like it. And what He was saying is these are linked together. If you're going to do the one, then you're going to do the other. To love your neighbor as yourself. If you love God, then you're going to love your neighbor. That was the answer Jesus gave. But He says something. He says, love God with all of your heart. With all of your heart. See, a lot of you are like, I do. I do, I can see it. Do you love God with all your heart? You would immediately. If I ask you to stand up, yes, I do. But when, when we look at our lives, when we look at our lives, do we really? Does, does our life say that we love God with our whole heart? i got to tell you, I struggle. I struggle with it because sometimes my heart is divided with other things. Sometimes it's easy to let our heart get so mixed up and, and everything. How, how can we truly love God with our whole heart? And, and to go further, what if your heart is broken? How can you love God with a broken heart? How can you love God with a broken heart? Is there anybody here today that you've had a broken heart? See, I'm not just talking about before you got saved. God came in and He mended your heart. I'm talking about after you got saved. You're walking as a Christian and your heart was broken. Have you ever been in that place? Are you in that place right now? You say, well, not right now, but was an experience that you had where your heart was broken, is it still lingering? Is it still lingering? How can I love God with my whole heart when my heart is broken? And 1 John 4.19 is the answer. It says that we love Him Jesus, because He first loved us. We love Him because He first loved us. Cause and effect, the only way you can love Jesus with your whole heart is if you first see, and sometimes we need reminded of how much it is that He loves us. We need reminded. You remember what it was like when you first got saved. Maybe when you first got filled with the Holy Spirit. The first experience that you really had with God and His love. Do you remember that passion that you had? Do you remember how you, how you loved Him with your whole heart? And you know why? Because you could see. You could see that love that He had for you. The hardest thing about loving a spouse, loving a wife, loving your husband with your whole heart is the fear of what if they don't love me the same way that I love them. But the, the, the key here is we can know 
We can know with a certainty how much it is that Jesus loves us. Do you remember that first love that you had? Do you remember when, when, you, when you first saw that Jesus loved you? I heard a, a, a minister friend of mine, he was telling me this story. He was in youth ministry as a teenager and he was in the, in the youth group and he said for the first time he could really see God's love for him. The first time he could really see this love that God had for him. You see, it's one thing to hear the gospel your whole life. Many of you, maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you didn't. I don't know, but, but I did. And I'd heard the gospel. I'd heard the gospel preached. I sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I sang the B-I-B-L-E. That was the book for me. You know, I, I, be, I believed what the gospel said, but I had never really truly seen it. It had never really hit home with me. And I'd, I'd gotten saved when I was uh, 19, 18, 19 years old, and I'd went to a youth camp. And for the first time, I had an experience with God where I could really see it. I seen my sin like it really was, the filth of my sin. And then I could see Jesus walking up to the, to the cross. I could see Him stretched out wide and lifted high for me. I could see that He really loved me. I could see it for the first time. And, and from then on, things changed. I could just see that God loved me. You see, my friend that was in this youth group, he, he said the first time that he's seen it, he said it was like the greatest revelation that he'd ever had. And he said that he had asked the youth minister if he could speak and that, and that God had really given him something. And he stood up before the youth group and he said, Jesus loves me. He loves me. And they looked at him like y'all are looking at me now. Like he was crazy. Well, we know that, so... You know, no, you don't understand. Jesus loves me. He loves me. He could really see it. Do you know that this morning? That Jesus loves you. Do you know the price that He paid? Do you know the cup that He drank? Do you know that if there had been nobody else but you, that He would have done it? That you're a pearl in His eyes. You're a treasure in the sight of God. Do you believe that? Do you see it this morning? Do you see the love that God has for you. Luke 4.18, Jesus stood up in the synagogue. First public message that Jesus gave. And he, he said, The Lord has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And then He said, To heal the brokenhearted. See, the broken heart begins to be healed when you really begin to see God's love for you. When you truly see it. Think about the conditions on salvation. Number one, Jesus died for our sin. On a cross, He was buried. And on the third day, He was resurrected from the grave. And the Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you would believe that, and where do you believe? In your heart. That God raised Jesus from the dead and confessed with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Before you can ever truly believe, before you can ever truly begin to love God with your whole heart, you've got to first see that He loved you. And when you see that, and when you, when you begin to believe it, because God has healed the broken heart. Because God has done it. Not because you, we just made a decision. Some of you may feel like you decided to come to church this morning. And that's why you're here. And, and that's part of it. But you see, God knew you would be here. And God allowed you to be here. God is the reason that we're here this morning. God decided for us to be here. It's not an accident, but it's for a reason. We can come into church so many times and just leave out the same way. We take it for granted. I know that I'm guilty of this. But we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Because the Gospel, when we hear it, it has the power to change our heart. In John 13, 34, Jesus said this. He said, Love others as I have loved you. You see, once your heart is mended by seeing God's love for you, then you're in a position to begin to love others. See, this is where it gets hard. See, we're real quick. You know, we want to, we'll raise our hand and it's, it, we see God's love for us. But then, then how do we begin to love others? How, how, how can we do that? In Luke chapter 10, you, you know the story about the man who was beaten and bloodied and people was, would just kind of walk by him and just leave him laying. And then a Samaritan man came by and he, he stopped, he stooped down and he, he began to wrap the guy up and take care of him. And 
And it says that he put oil on him. He loved the guy. He loved the guy that was hurting. He loved the guy that was bruised. I think one of the hardest things, even after our heart is mended, one of the hardest things is to really love our neighbor as ourselves. To really love others as Christ has loved us. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Love others as I have loved you. You know why it's hard to love people? Because they get on their nerves. Do people ever just get on your nerves? Oh my goodness. Don't they? I mean, sometimes people just get to me. And, and some, I just want to go home with my family, shut the door, batten down the hatches, shut the blinds. I mean, isn't that what we do? Isn't that what we do? We just shut everything down and we don't want to see anybody. We just want to, you know, watch some TV and go to bed and, and then we wake up the next day and we start over. But people are annoying. They are. The thing is, is we're people. We're all people. We all got that in common. So even everybody has their own thing that gets on our nerves. Everybody has something. Right? But let me tell you, one of the greatest things that we have in common is that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody here. We're all guilty. We're all guilty of that. Every one of us. And this morning, I, I, want, I want to talk to you about how to love somebody. How to love somebody. And one aspect of loving someone, one aspect of loving someone is not exposing them. Not exposing them, but showing them mercy. Not just walking by. Not just walking by when you know someone's hurting. But going to them and showing them love. Something that I've been praying about lately because I feel like I've struggled in this sometimes when somebody's telling me something that, that might be wrong or uh, that might be on their mind. And, and you can just see their heart. And I've just been asking God to give me the compassion that He has. Give me compassion for, for the person, whatever it is, a stranger, anyone. The, the person that's laying on the road that's hurting. Give me compassion. As Jesus would have compassion, give me that same compassion. In, in the book of Genesis, there's a story about Noah. And this, this man Noah, we know, was a man of righteousness. The Bible says it. He says that he preached righteousness. That he built an ark. And after the ark, it went, it went through the flood. Then it was through his family, because of his obedience to God, his whole family was saved. And it was through this family that God populated the earth. But right after the flood, we, we see something that happened with Noah. It says that he became a husbandman. That he began to... He, he began to grow vines. And then it said he started to drink from the vine. Right? Well, he drank a little too much from the vine. Bottom line is, he got drunk. Alright? And he, found, he ended up being naked in the tent and he was exposed. And his sons, instead of going right to him and covering him, they allowed him to be exposed. They allowed him to be exposed. And as a result, it says in Genesis that this line of Canaan would be under the dominion, now listen to this, would be under the dominion of the heathen nations because of the desire to expose Noah's frailty. Now I want, I want us to think about this for a minute. Do you think it could be that the reason that the church hasn't maybe been as effective as it should have been is because of our, our desire to expose others' frailty? Our desire to expose others' nakedness. You say, well... Well, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by exposing frailty or exposing nakedness? In 1 Peter 4.8, it says, Above all, love each other deeply. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers up the nakedness. Love covers up the frailty. Love doesn't expose others' frailty. Love covers it. Love says, I, I will pray for them. But what, what happens and what we want to, want to do is we want to call up our friends and tell them about what others has done, especially if it's somebody that's in the church and they, they've done something. It, it's real easy to speak evil of somebody else. I, I'm guilty of this also. Remember, I, I just said people get on my nerve, right? I just said that a minute ago. So it's real easy for me to, to say something about somebody. And it's not that it's a lie. You know, you know what somebody has done, right? And instead of covering them and loving them, praying for them, reaching out to them, 
Isn't it easy for us all to expose them? We want to expose them maybe through gossip or, or through uh, tail-bearing or just talking about somebody else. There was something I learned growing up, and I haven't always been real good at it, but it, it was this saying that if you don't have anything good to say, then don't say anything at all. I've been trying to teach my son and my daughter. They talk a lot. My son and daughter, I mean they talk all the time. If, if my son was in the car with you and you went on a two-hour trip, he may not stop the whole time unless he fell asleep. And that, that's good. He has a lot of cool things to say. I like to hear what he says. And my daughter is the same way. I like to hear what she says. Sometimes well, when I'm praying about what to preach on, I'll talk to her about it. And she's get, she'll, she'll just give me the coolest ideas about what to preach on. But I've been trying to teach them not to talk so much because the Bible says to be slow to speak and quick to listen. So I say it over and over. And my son's got to where he'll correct us. You know, if we, we, we keep talking and don't let other Be slow to speak, Dad. Quick to listen. You now he's six years old. My six-year-old's telling me to be slow to speak and quick to listen. I heard this story of a Christian man who, who he was well known for not speaking evil of anyone. He wouldn't speak evil about anybody. So his friends, being the good Christian friends that they were, were going to try to trap him and get him to talk about somebody. There was this guy in the town, and he, uh, he was well known for just being hateful and miserable. I mean, there really wasn't anything good to say about the guy. So the friends, they, they got to him and they said, well, what do you think about so-and-so? What, what's your opinion of them? And, the guy stepped back and he thought and he crossed his arms. And when he came back, he said, You know, I heard he had a lovely wife. <laughs> so if you don't have anything good to say, just, just direct it somewhere else. Roman, Romans, some of y'all are just now getting that. <laughs> y'all know some people like that? Is that what it is? That uh, nothing good to say about them, so they have a lovely wife. Romans chapter 5 says that Jesus commended His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even while we were in our sin. That Christ, we can't ever forget that. We must always remember. It always begins with that too. With knowing God's love for us. That's where it begins. You see that, then you can love God with all your heart. And when you truly are loving God with your whole heart, He will enable you to love others the way that He has loved you. You know the story of the Good Shepherd where uh, the Good Shepherd left the 99 to go after the one. You might hear a story about a man or a woman who maybe they've been overtaken in a fault. Maybe they haven't been in church in a long time. In fact, if, if I was to ask you right now, just think of somebody. You might, somebody might come into your mind right now. They used to be in church, but they're not anymore. They used to just follow Jesus. They used to be on fire for God, but now they're not. And they've been taken in a fault. And I know what, what I've been prone to do is, and you, maybe you too, is how could they do that? How could they, how could they be overtaken so easily? How could they fall out of church. I mean, they heard the Word of God just like we did. They heard the theology. They heard the Scripture. They were in the presence of God. How could that be if, if they really had experienced God's love and experienced uh, uh, the same power that we experienced? How could they be overtaken in a fault? How could they fall away? How could that be? But whenever that happens, whenever you feel yourself being prone to doing that, like I am, what God, what God will do with me sometimes is He'll, He'll put His Word up in my face like a mirror and as I begin to look into it, it's as if God is saying to me, how could you? How could you not have mercy on them when I had mercy on you? How could you leave them? How could you not have compassion on them? How could you not love them when I have loved you the way that I have? I have loved you with my whole heart. How could you not love them? You say, well, I have a broken heart have a broken heart. It's hard. It's hard to love others. It's hard to love you, God. Do you believe that God's heart has ever been broken? Do you believe that Jesus' heart breaks when people reject Him every day? 
He knows what a broken heart is. He knows what rejection is. You say, well, you haven't been rejected like I have. You know, maybe I haven't, but I have experienced rejection. I have experienced it. But I would challenge you that you hadn't experienced it the way Jesus has. That He gave everything. He gave everything for a lost and dying world. And day by day, many, many, the Bible says, reject Him. Many reject Jesus. Many say, no, I see what you did, I see the gift that you gave, but no thanks. I don't want it. Can you imagine giving, just, just putting all your love into one gift for somebody and you went to give it to them and they said, nah, I don't really want it, no thanks. Can you imagine how heartbreaking that would be? Now imagine it was the gift that Jesus gave. But He gave His life. He was broken, He was beaten, He was bruised. He took stripes on His back. He hung naked on a cross for hour after hour. Hanging there exposed for you and for me with His love. Many times I see God reminding me, how could I not reach out in compassion and love others the way He has loved me when He showed me mercy so many times? Maybe you look inside yourself and you say, I just don't have it. I just don't, I don't see it. I, it was there one time. Maybe you say, there was that, that was in there at one point. But I, I've reached out to too many people. And I've had my heart broke too many times. I just can't do it the same way that I used to. I really wasn't that wise back then. We, we use that sometimes. Well, you've got to use wisdom. You can't love people like that. You've got to use wisdom. Because if you don't, I mean, they'll... They'll get you. They'll get you. So we don't love like we did in the beginning. We don't love with that first love that we had in the beginning. When we first seen that love that God had for us, we wanted to go out and tell everybody about how Jesus loved them. We wanted to go out and tell everybody about how to get to heaven. We wanted to go out and love everyone. We wanted them to come to church. We'd invite them and we would tell them about the Gospel. There was this light, this fire that was in us, this life that was inside of us. And, and, and it's not maybe like it used to be. See, this tree that we talked about in the beginning that once had life, it had been cut down and it seemed like there wasn't much evidence of life in it anymore. In fact, it says the stump may even die in the ground. But then it says something. It says there's that... There is hope for the tree. Yet. There is hope for the tree yet. And it says, at the scent of water, it will bud. At the scent of water, it will bud. If you can hear the Word of God today calling you, calling out to you, reaching out to you, if you can just sense it, that God is reaching out to you, saying, return. Return to the way you used to love. Return. I know your heart's been broken. I'll put it back together again. Love me because I have first loved you. If you can hear the Word of God calling out to you, reaching out to you, guess what? There's hope. There's hope. There's hope for us. Even, even if that same love isn't there like it used to, be, used to be, guess what? God can restore it. God can restore it. There is hope even yet. Even after all you've been through, God loves you. God loves you. He wants to restore that life that was once there, that love that was once there, even through the heartbreak, even through everything that you've been through. There's things that you all have been through maybe you hadn't even told anybody. Torments in your mind. When nobody else is around, you've been tormented in your mind about the heartbreak and the things that you've went through. I want you to know that God knows about it and that He's willing to just wrap you up, piece you back together again and, and get you in that position where you begin, begin to love others the way Christ has loved you. And when you do that, the Bible speaks of us having a, a light that shines out. That light is the joy of the Lord. And the joy of the Lord glorifies God. And when that, that joy within us is, is in our life and it's shining out every day in our life, at work, in our family, in our home, in our church, around people that get on our nerves, if that joy is shining out, and, and that life is just shining out as a light into the world. The Bible says that the, the world will see that and they will give glory and honor to your Father that is in heaven. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe that? 
If you would, I just want to ask you to bow your heads with me this morning and let's pray. I want to ask the musicians to come up for a few moments and, and just play something softly. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and the power of it. I thank you, God, that there is hope. That there is hope yet. And the only hope that we have is in you. The only hope we could ever have is in you. Lord, we just thank you for loving us. We look to that love. We look to the price that you paid. God, and we recognize it. Thank you for for paying the price on the cross. And Lord, I just pray that your love would be alive in us. I pray, God, that you would mend the brokenhearted this morning. That you would heal the brokenhearted. And that you would get us in the position to love others as you have loved us. Jesus' name, just with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I just want to ask you first, if you're in here today and you say, Brandon, I've been through some heartbreak. My heart has been broken more than once. And I have struggled to love with the love that you talked about today. I've been through that heartbreak and I've, I've had a hard time loving like I once did that's you this morning, I just want to ask you to be honest and just lift up your hand. Lift up your hand right where you are. I see that hand. I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand. Hands going up. Praise you. Praise you. As we're playing this song this morning, those of you that raised your hand, I just want to ask you just to make a stand today and say, you know what? No matter what anybody thinks, I want to go up and I want my heart mended. I want my heart healed. I want that love that I used to have. I just want to ask you to come up to the altar today and we're going to pray together. Would you come this morning? Would you come? The altar is open.